getting paper. The Daily News is going to be delivering to our neighborhood. Moscow Pullman Daily News mm -hmm. was not, why well, was it not delivered? They have a hard time since COVID and getting newspaper carriers to the neighborhood to go there. Really? Cool papers. Basically. Huh. Yeah, I like a physical paper, physical books, all those kinds of things. Um, I like so much better than than Kindle. I understand why it's convenient, but um, that's good. That's good news for your. I kind of reading the daily news when it wasn't in paper. If I'm going to go online and read a paper, I will probably read a better paper. Sure, right. But just, yeah, you know, it's good to look at your local paper. Yeah, we're getting early. Let me show, give you a shout out. I just finished this this weekend. That's uh, beautiful. Thank you. That's a don't tell anybody. That's a oh. gift for um, Dominic, oh. who was confirmed. Oh. And he asked me to be his sponsor. Oh. Yeah, don't tell anybody. Wow. That's the that law. A while from that season. <laughs> you know, it's a five star from you know. Well, Cora's thesis will be defending. Say what? Cora's thesis. She's writing her um, the thesis that she has to defend at Logos for um, arguing that it's okay to depict uh, the divine persons. Oh, oh, that's really an interesting topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it is because, <laughs> and you know, we're just talking about planetary economy. So you can't feed one of that. Uh huh. No, yeah. You have to. Yes. You haven't read it. Yeah, it's it's in there. Oh, I mean, I would love to read it. Oh, yeah. Um, that's that's in that book. How, how does it go? Let's say all things. Oh, the crisis must converge. And that's the collection of short stories. Oh, all it's that one. And they're all great. Huh? No, I just. Got from the library at the time. But yeah, it was. Yeah, it's it's worth reading. Like, I remember Bob Darren comment on her how um, people, I can't, I wish I had the time. I just told Russian in the car and then I totally forgot to. What? My hair. Oh. Can I be in a couple of minutes? Yeah. No, no. Yeah, I, I was saying it was really good. It's very, very long. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Remember um, the Sayu and Rose there, though. No, yeah. no, no, there's no more patents. No more. Dude, Pat, was patent assassinated, dude? I heard it. You heard it. You never heard that? No, we got to we got to talk later. Yes, I've heard heard Pat was assassinated because he was going to come back to America. How do you know how he died? He died in a car crash, and he died in a hospital in Europe. And he was supposed to come back to America. Patton was, and he was going to run against. He was going to, you know, uh, Truman was still president, but he was going to be the president instead of Eisenhower. He could and people said he was taken out because he had the reviews. So, anyone ever hear that? A lot of people had comments with Patton. So. Yeah, but most, but I think a lot of people had problems like he slapped the soldier and things like that, right? He was too like hardcore, but yeah, but he, I mean, he didn't take a lot of blood. He did not have a lot of blood. Good, good, good. There's too many yes men. In the girls, uh, James Bond marathon over spring break. They watched all the James Bonds. No. They uh, but like, but so was it like? They don't like the really modern. I was gonna say it's like Sean Connery, like the old Bond movies. Oh, those okay. I did the same thing on it for me. I actually reenacted all of his exploits. I was in Europe most of the time. Yeah, yeah. Got real closer because you know, yeah. Yeah. That was good. That was good. Good friend. You got it. Does anyone does anyone like Pierce Brosnan as Bond or no? I don't. Yeah, Daniel Craig's great, right? Who's the next Bond? Who, did have they decided yet? Well, he's Will Smith. Will Smith, yeah, from <laughs> No, but Daniel Craig is still in that one, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, no, I have seen it. What's it called? I did see it. Uh, I absolutely saw it. It came out like it came out like a year ago or something. Yeah. Yeah, I saw it. It was it was pretty conclusive to the JML series. They could reenact it and do a different line of some story. Yeah. But as far as they, 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 they the, the, the girl takes over, right? It's like, yeah. am I the, the woman becomes a double woman, another, yeah. another, yeah. That's another example of a book series that they are rewriting to make it more woke. Because, you know, it's so okay. That's true. Maybe they'll do the one that makes fun of it. But it's not a funny world, Betsy. Yeah, Betsy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone know what this is? Anyone know what this is? What is that? What is this? this is, it's an it's an eraser. Okay. Um. Today's today's lecture. Welcome back. So welcome back, everyone watching Maple Syrup History. Our board is like a tattoo. This is from about ten days ago before spring break. It has not been erased. I am fixing probably not to ever erase it. You know, they went to do religious ed without erasing that. Hilarious. Oh, actually, they had a special class where they went to see the confessional, so it was okay. Oh, good. Uh, good. I want people to live in trembling fear of do not touch his board. That's what I want. That's the kind of, like, overall ambiance that I want. Um, this board has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about today. If you remember, Sam Crestlands had the gall, the chutzpah, you can say, to ask, did football win out? He suggested doing disputed questions and didn't show up yeah so anyways yeah what a fuss. yeah exactly <laughs> what a schmuck <laughs> um <laughs> anyways anyways we are on maple syrup history episode number 50 something i know logic number 18 because six of 17 classes leading up to the spring break from which we have just returned. If anyone listening online, like our beloved Eli and Charlotte have been wondering perhaps if they have been, where's maple syrup history been? It's always posted Monday and Wednesday. Of course, we were off last week. The lead up to that was six classes of St. Thomas, the dumb ox Aquinas, and we finished him and we're done with him. We'll return to him once more, probably in our discussions later about GK Chesterton. And if you follow the syllabus, you see at some point, not too long from now, we will be doing two classes on Blue Collar Apologetics. Very good book. John Martinoni, this e EWTN guy. Teresa Tamio, also EWTN personality. Maybe some of you know her. Wrote the forward to this. Very good book. We're going to do three classes on Chesterton. We're going to finish with David Foster Wallace. We're going to also have a class on the late, may God rest his soul, football coach Mike Leach um, and his quotes in chess theory. 
logical theory in chess at the board game. So that's all coming. But what's our connector from Aquinas and that train? Before spring break, we had a train that ran from the philosophers, from Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, into Cicero, into Aquinas. What is the connecting train from the philosophers' first half unto chess theory and David Foster Wallace? Well, it's some historical stuff starting today. General timeline from year 1300, then through the Renaissance, then we'll talk about not too long from now, in about three or four classes, uh, the great encyclicals on economics in the 19th and 20th centuries as we get closer to G.K. Chesterton. So today's lecture is entitled William of Ockham and the Black Plague. And the first thing I want to start off with is a general timeline from 1300 up to 1517. So uh, 1215 is the Magna Carta. 1215 is the signing of the Magna Carta. Which a lot of people talk about, right? This, 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 you know, rights to people. Some, you know, semblance, even kind of a penumbra, a shadow of popular rights, rights from the king. We in America have plagiarized everything from the British, and that's nothing wrong with that. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. But in 1688, this is you know, 400 whatever, 60 years after the Magna Carta, the Revolution of 1688. The idea that Parliament is king in Britain, the House of Lords, House of Commons, we have the Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, we take that directly into our you know, constitutional setup, into our idea of separation of powers. The executive, the legislative, the judicial branches, all that kind of stuff, right? And the real first seeds of that, you could argue, is the signing of the Magna Carta in 1215. In 1215, for a timeline connectivity, the Crusades are still ongoing. Remember, the Crusades are called by Pope Urban II in 1095, and they last until 1291. If any one of you came to our Spirit in Life, the last, um, um, our last installment, March 1st, talked about Aquinas in specificity and focus and talked about the Crusader King Louis IX and his mother Blanche. That's all this time. This time is the founding of universities, right? 1300 to 1517. Uh, 1088, University of Bologna, University of Paris, for which our guy who we just finished, Aquinas, is famous, famously associated with. And so to Albert the Great, University of Paris is 1200. Our beloved pastor, Father Chase Hasnerall, is currently at the University of Oxford. That's 1117. And you even go in further on, you know, Central Europe, founding of Jagiellonia University in Krakow, 1364. A lot of the foundations, so, so, so two things so far, right? There's two main points I've made so far in this timeline. This time period, which often is so overlooked, especially by us Americans, for whom history doesn't start until 1776. I mean, it's hard. If I go ask a, a guy who runs an apiary in Iowa, tell me something that happened a long time ago. Most likely, he's not going to be like, well, you know, in uh, the, the, the end of the Roman Republic, when Cicero held sway in the triumvirate of Mark Antony and etc., he's not, he's probably not going to go that far back. He's probably going to talk about 1776. And there's nothing wrong with that. But as Americans, right, we're still stuck very much in the paradigm of 1945, the post war world. And Biden keeps talking about this all the time this you know, rules based international order from World War II. And if you're going to go real old, we're not talking Egyptians or Romans for Americans often. It's often 1776. But look here, these two points where you have the founding of representative government in so many ways, this great charter, the Magna Carta in 1215, which really influences American democracy 500 some years later when the founding fathers sit down to hammer out these details. And that's point number one, representative government, Magna Carta. Point number two, the university system. We're very proud of our universities in America. And Dave, you mentioned earlier before, you know, about woke and all this kind of stuff. And okay, I mean, these are the kind of arguments, like have some of the universities gone totally off the rails. Like if, if your daughter, if your son had a full ride offer to Harvard, would you counsel them? Maybe don't go because, you know, now they're doing like bug language, you know, and like, let's, let's talk about how parents can vote, you know, like maybe, maybe they've gone too far. I don't know. If you, if you're in the university rankings, you know, Every year, Harvard is number one in the world, right? Harvard's a very old university. I think it's 1636, perhaps, the founding date. That's still, you know, centuries after this European system that's emerging. So two points here really quickly, right? 
representative government university system. 1347, 1453, 116 years, but it's known as the Hundred Years' War, fought between Great Britain and France. Who's the most famous figure of this Hundred Years' War, arguably? You all know her, Joan of Arc. Burned the stake, tried to get the true king um, back on the throne. Saint Joan of Arc, she's canonized in 1920. 19 year old girl, amazing fighter, street fighter style, fight club, burn yourself with acid. First rule don't talk about fight club. Joan of Arc, patron saint of fight club. Yeah, that's what I say. 100 years war, the British, because good riddance. Wow. What is the difference between British food and a bucket of slop? The bucket. The Hundred Years' War, the British are kicked off of the continent. We talk about the idea of the British Isles, Brexit, across the pond. We talk about across the pond from a British perspective. They mean us, right? They're, they're American cousins. But the British are the original across the pond from continental Europe. And the question of, are they part of the, the EU? And of course, now they have not been since 2016. <laughs> but this Hundred Years' War and the ultimate French victory removes all kind of British claims to the continent. Because in that English channel, I mean, people have swum across, across that. It's very, very close, right? 15th century, uh, you're already getting towards the Renaissance, although we'll talk about that next class, the so-called Age of Discovery, very controversial Christopher Columbus, right, who some Catholics say is a saint, and a lot of secular people say he's a genocidal maniac, Adolf Hitler, you know, I mean, really, Columbus, like, it goes the full spectrum of, like, hate, love, etc., but Columbus and, you know, 1492, 1494 to 1559, the Italian Wars, the Venetian League is the first modern European defense alliance, very much like the Delian League of the 5th century BC, when the Greeks ally against the Persians. 1512, Copernicus, uh, you know, argues for in his book, Temeritariolus, that the planets, everything revolves around the sun that it is heliocentric, not, as Ptolemy would say, geocentric, the universe. And 1513, Machiavelli writes the Prince, Florentine Histories, which will, the, the Prince and Florentine Histories, two separate books, we'll talk about his argument for cyclical power next class. And finally, guys, finally, everyone, hello, everybody, listen, last point, what is 1517? Why is that important? Why am I finishing up the timeline today at 1517? What happened then, Betsy, you of neighbors of these persuasions? Um, I would say the uh, Protestant revolt. Indeed. Ooh, controversial term by Betsy. Protestant revolt. They weren't reforming anything. These rebels, Protestant rebellion. Betsy, what do you mean when you said bring back the stakes? Light them up. What is that? You're talking about that. You said a city councilor day. You said, like, you know, what if we just eliminated all our enemies? What did you mean by that? Oh, that, that wasn't you. Oh, my bad. Or that, that was said. Oh, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I, want, I want to. I've said so many times. I, I've said so many. I've said so many times. I want to go into a board meeting, right? Imagine, imagine, a, you know, a CEO comes down, part of a company, right? And we're sitting around. And it's just disgusting. I hate this about corporate anything. And corporate America is spilled into all facets, academia, whatever. Where the CEO comes down and like, hey, gang, numbers are up. Everyone doing good? Here's your gift bag. Positive, right? Positive feedback. And they go around the table, right? And like, so, you know, anyone want to add anything? And you're like, you know, I just want to say, boss, thanks to your fearless leadership. The speech you gave last uh, last month in Kansas City, that inspired me to get my sales up. And everyone starts clapping. Like, really, it's kind of like a stupid pep talk nonsense. I would love to say when they're going around, they want to add anything. I'd be like, yeah. I want to just, uh, I want to raise something since we're all doing this team building thing. We're here together. Trish, you never talked last time. I think it'd be worth just mentioning what you said. Um, because because everyone's here and get like, feedback. What did you mean when you said the company was too tolerant and is prejudice that bad? What did you mean? I just want to like, say these kind of art or like. You'll say you feel worse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but just like, I would just love to like, because then, then, at that point you say something like that. And they didn't say it. For the record, Betsy Johnson never said something like that. But then what does she say? Like, I just mentioned that. Wait, I didn't say that. Oh, oh sure you did. Now you're denying it. 
but uh, on Reformation Day, remembered um, as October 31st, 15. 17. That's where you asked 1517. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And that's the exact date. Exactly. It's the date of Luther Species. And every year on Reformation Day, mm -hmm. the fifth graders at Loga School have a relay race in the gym mm -hmm. where they race to uh, across the gym, uh, putting up all of Luther Species. They get divided. Okay. So see, that, that, uh, <sighs> Why do why do Catholics support? I don't understand that. Like I, we believe in more of Luther's theses than the Protestants do. Do we really? But we do. I know and that it's, it's a good it's a good reminder. You know, since my kids participate in that, I I use it as a teaching thing, and we go through Luther's theses and we uh, discuss which ones Catholics believe and which ones they don't, and which ones these Protestants that are going to school don't believe, which are a lot more. And we discussed how once you leave the church, you start leaving more and more and more. And what are the odds that church. that what are the odds that all of Moscow becomes like a Catholic oasis in the midst of barbarism? Correct. You know, every three years for all those Christian people to um, go through the ordinariate and um, have a really great Catholic church. Amen. Yeah, because they well they well they have on their website they talk about the Catholicity of the church and stuff. Yeah. Anyway, I take that. Betsy Johnson, you are you're a good person. God bless you. Thank you. It's good that you're in the city. We need more good people like you. And that is said. That is said sincerely, truly. Um, and praise God. Uh, last point before we move on to William the Black Plague. The Black Plague happened this time, 1347 to 1350. One of the most devastating pandemics in human history, I probably not to tell you this, it's probably more acutely felt in our era of COVID, just coming out of COVID, killed an estimated 75 to 200 million people. And there's different you know, theories of how it arrived. A lot of people say, of course, um, you know, from the, the Silk Road trading system, you know, Marco Polo, the spice trade out of the East. Um, I wonder more than one. I mean, no, that this was the big one, but didn't it recur? Like, I think, yeah, exactly. Yes, very good. Yeah. yeah. Sadly, yeah. No, there's outbreaks. I think the last case of plague was was like eradicated like in 1979 or something. But then recently, people have fallen ill with it. Like there's some like rabid marmot or something that bit someone. Like the, the bacteria is Yersinia pestis. And from what I understand, I, I'm very much not an epidemiologist, but it was transmitted by fleas and um, rats, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, it traveled along the the Silk Road, reaches Crimea, very much in the news now. Crimea is that you know Russophone ethnic Russian part of Ukraine now claimed by Russia, annexed by Putin recently, right? Reaches Crimea by 1346 most likely carried by oriental rat fleas living on black rats. And these rats were often like in the, you know, the hull of the ship, whatever, just in these merchant ships they're coming across. The black death is estimated to have killed 30 to 60% of Europe's total population. All in all, the plague reduced the world population um, by an enormous number from like 400 some million people down to 300 some million. It takes 150 years for Europe's population to recover. So the, the, the normal you know, rate of propagation and population mm -hmm. increase, 133 years after the Black Death, the population is less than it was in 1346. People are still recovering. It's generational. Mm -hmm. And yeah, exactly. This is an amazing point. This is an amazing point. Thank you, Barb. The plague reoccurred occasionally in Europe until the 19th century. And it, it, it was widespread. It's like pockets popping up. And you said your answer was so perfect because exactly not to this level, not to this extreme level, but it was kind of, you know, would flare up here and there. Mm -hmm. William of Ockham is a guy actually who dies from the Black Plague. William of Ockham is born in 1287. He dies in 1347. An English Franciscan friar, classic philosopher, Franciscan, St. Francis, I mean, I don't have to explain that further, but just like the FYI, right? St. Thomas Aquinas, Dominican. Occam is a Franciscan friar. He is um, from the British Isles. Yes, but you have a spelling on his last name. Absolutely. Um, O-C-K-H-A-M. 
Yeah. That's actually not his name, right? That's what William of Ockham. Yeah, it's yeah. like Thomas Aquinas, Thomas from Aquino. Yeah, but right. <clears throat> um, he studied at Merton College, Oxford, and was said to have um, another very, very famous medieval philosopher, John Dun Scotus, as a teacher. Um, around the year 1310, in this, in this time he's born in 1287, so he's 23 years old. 1310, he goes to Paris. And 10 years later, 1320, he becomes a teacher at the University of Paris. And he's working constantly on Aristotle, on his philosophy, his physics, his logic. So was he, maybe you've already said this, was he there at the same time as Aquinas? He was not. So he's born in 1287. Aquinas dies in 1274. So he's born 13 years after Aquinas died. Like this whole time from our perspective, mm -hmm. from their perspective. Yeah. Not but yeah, no, it's, it's okay. What's a good example here? Um, let me think of a good example. Uh, choo, 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 choo. Ockham and Aquinas. Right. <laughs> but someone knows, someone like someone who's born now, Becca, Dominic, people born in the 90s, are they contemporaries of Ronald Reagan? Absolutely. They might have been born, you know, five years after Reagan died, but in the long thousand, hundred thousand year of history, like Bessie said, of course they are, but like they are, they are not, they are not actual contemporaries. So, right? They they are literally Aquinas, you know, has been praise God in heaven mm -hmm. for thirteen years and gone from this earth before Occam comes out of his mother's womb. So it's like there is no crossover whatsoever. But there's going to be a huge crossover in terms of intellectual seating and a lot of controversy. And please note this: William of Occam. We're finally breaking open this class about logic. We're always trying to stick with that. Is one of the first great challenges to the logic, the logical system we've been developing. Remember last class? And if you don't remember, you can go and rewatch it on um, YouTube on our channel. Remember last class? We did kind of a little review. Talked about different, you know, syllogisms and fallacies, and just the overall petty plumber's logic. That is based so many ways on kind of Socratic, Platonic, and even though Plato and Aristotle are, are different, Socratic, Platonic, and Aristotelian principles, and about you know the world is knowable, especially Aristotle by way of Aquinas, and of course talked about Boethius and Augustine, like God, who is the uncaused, non-contingent being, I am who am, has ordered the universe in a certain way, and there are the universal connecting, synapsing threads, and you can know things. Occam, you can argue, is the first postmodernist. Some people have called him the first Protestant. So he's going to be one of the first logical challenges to um, this system. Now, in three, 1323, before we, we're going to talk about two things about well, William of Ockham, two main things, his razor and nominalism. And then we're going to be done. But I want to give you more of his biography. Still. So William of Ockham, again, born in 1287, dies in 1347, God rest his soul, dies from the Black Lake. So it's not even just, an, an, this is a perfect contemporary. He dies from this, this horrible, this, this horrible um, pandemic. William of Ockham resigns his chair at the university in 1323 to devote himself to ecclesiastical politics. So Ockham is like philosopher king is wrong. He's not, a, he's not a king. He's not, you know, he's a Franciscan prior, but he's very much involved in secular and, and church state affair type stuff. And you can talk about, you talk about one of the first great, things in church state affairs. You talk about the investiture crisis of 1122, the 12th century, about who should appoint, you know, appoint bishops. I'm the Bishop of Blank. Sam Cresslins is the local, you know, Duke or the, the Prince of this thing. Who's in charge? Does Sam direct me or I him or we have separate spheres? William of Ockham at times appears an advocate of secular absolutism. He denies the right of popes to exercise temporal power. Pope St. Pius IX, 1800s Pope, 500 years after this, is angry that these Italian atheists, these Masons, they don't want to respect his temporal power. They're like, no, Your Holiness, you have no right to have a jurisdiction in, in what is then called the Papal States. You want to create secular Italy. The church often, all the way up to the 20th century, guys, I hate to break this to you. The church often is not huge on democracy as we define it in our modern world. Just do whatever you want, listen to the people, whatever the people want. Like subsidiarity, 
certainly we talked about that of like you know local keep things on the lowest local level possible and that kind of course and often in many ways and praise god for the church because she is the spotless bride of christ it's actually the best democracy because having a certain actual hierarchy and authoritarian structure leads to actual real freedom of choice and people will be having a say but the church is not and has not often seen like oh america voting great Pope uh, Pius X, St. Pius X, talks about, you know, the classic Catholic position. He's Pope until 1914, that the soul of the state should be the church. The church should be involved in the public square, period. Catholics have always said, Occam, back in the 1300s, going full America. And like, no, Pope should not be involved. You know, secular power, whatever. Well, he, there's arguments on both sides. Give me arguments on both sides. You better make them logical, though. Okay, so... Um, power corrupts and riches and things of the world corrupt and having a pope involved in um, secular power tends to corrupt the pope there's a lot of corruption in um, lots of the ways things are governed and it just just makes the pope more um, more corrupt also when the pope is involved in secular things people may turn against the teachings of the church and things of God just because they're against the Pope's secular um, movements and choices. On the other side, um, God created the world. God um, gave us a church. And when we separate church and state, the state may be doing unchristian things that lead us in the wrong way. And the state has a lot of powers in our lives. Therefore, we ought to have the church involved in the state getting us um, the best opportunities to end up in heaven. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank okay, you. So both sides. No, great. Thank you. That was, that was very succinct and very good. Thank you. Um, Occam, his whole attitude towards the church and the state, though, is seen as this kind of like attitude of protesting in a certain sense. And Occam, I don't want to go as far as calling him the anti aquinas but kind of. Remember, Occam's the first postmodernist kind of like, if, if, if what does Aquinas tell us? Aquinas takes the apex of the mountain logic, this class, plumber's logic. Things are what they are. Remember, Chesterton said Aquinas is great contribution is that an egg is an egg and a chair is a chair and i mean that's like small stuff the five proofs of god existence god's existence that trish so well summed up like three weeks ago quite is like that's ultimately logical design contingency etc all this kind of stuff non-move mover occam basically says no to all of that occam says that um uh Human reason can prove neither the immortality of the soul nor the existence, unity, and infinity of God. These truths are known to us by revelation alone. This is why some people call him the first Protestant. You know, Martin Luther is not logical. So I, if he's, you could say he's great. I'm, I would say to anyone, to, any, to Lutheran's face, like, no, I get like close up and like you can bump noses. I'll say to them that close to his face. Martin Luther, Protestantism is anti logical, it just is. And you know what? Let's play devil's advocate. And it's that's great. And that's how it should be. You know, Soren Kierkegaard, very good Protestant. Because what did he say? What's his famous thing? The leap of faith. We don't even know if God exists. You never can know. Our, our reason is so destroyed. That's a huge difference in Catholics and Protestants, right? A lot of Protestants, especially Calvinists, these tulip people, these five things, total depravity, the first one, that our reason has been so destroyed by original sin, we can know nothing. It's almost like complete, it's almost like atheistic belief. So I, I have no idea God even exists. I'm just going to believe he does. I'm going to trust him and jump into the darkness. That is not Aquinas. That is not anything we've talked about so far. Aquinas says you absolutely can know by grace-infused reason that God exists and these are things are true and the immortality of the soul. Occam's like, you have no idea. I just believe. What does that sound like? Luther, sola fide, on faith alone, I just believe that Christ, because he said he's the son of God, I'm going to go with that. I'm going to trust it. But I can never know rationally. I can just trust God and make that leap into the dark. But I'm uh, who, who, how dare Aquinas say that you can know God exists and all these, how he knows these things about angels. We can know nothing. We're so depraved. Again, he, that he is 100% in the bosom of Holy Mother Church. He's not a Protestant. Make that clear. But what I'm saying is you see already these kind of seeds of these things. It's kind of doubt. And please note 
thing he's most famous for, nominalism, which is the denial of all universals. It's 100% anti-Plato too. Plato talked about, right? There's, there's a perfect chair. There's a perfect human being. There's a perfect, like in this, in this abstract heavenly realm, there are forms, there are ideals um, to which all, from which all things take their being, right? And as Catholics, we believe like, you know, God is ultimate perfection. He is perfection itself, right? Uh, in nominalism, this skepticism that Occam's already um, putting forth in politics, in philosophy, he's going to apply it to there are no universals. He doesn't go full nominalist. He doesn't go full skeptic. But he's like, no, basically, Dave, you're you're talking like Plato. You're talking like Aquinas. You're talking about this idea of like there's this, this perfect chair, this perfect tree. That's in your mind. That's only in your mind. Okay? The idea of universals are constructs of our mind. Of, of, of you know all these individual people as unique as a fingerprint and in fact they're they're we can't be sure there are universals everyone just has their own kind of thing and it's, it's unique people might be trees people i don't know you 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 see and we're going to talk about it next class i believe already you see how you go from william of Ockham to renee descartes if all you get is what i'm going to say now in this class that's good aquinas famously said he didn't say this but i'm going to reverse the card Aquinas' philosophy can be can be described as um, I am, therefore I think. I am because God is, therefore I think, I love, I fight, I whatever. Remember, Aquinas' whole philosophy is based on essentialism. Exodus 3.14, John 8.58. Exodus 3.14 says, you know, I am who am. God is the non-contingent being whose, whose, whose uh, nature is simply to exist. I, Aquinas, I am particular individual me because God is the one universal. God's from God's being, everything else takes its shape. Aquinas would say, I am. Um, therefore, I think I am because God is. Occam is already saying, I don't know what is. I don't know if there is a kind of like, I, I believe in God, but I don't, I, but I don't believe in God in the kind of logical way Aquinas lays out. I'm just like diving in the dark. Yeah, there's a God. I'm just trusting him. I don't know the way Aquinas says. Rene Descartes is famously going to say, I think, therefore I am. He's going to take the night. I'll come here one second, I promise. Descartes is going to take the nominalism of, of Occam, the doubt and uncertainty, say all we can be sure of is that our own mind. And with Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am. It's cogito ergo sum. You get the modern matrix and all that kind of stuff. And Betsy, maybe you're a figment of my imagination. Solipism. Like that, that, that. Smaller child, whether anybody else existed. Okay, and then and this is a very that 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 is funny. That is funny, but also dead, that is dead serious philosophically. That's where Cartesian thought leads you. Maybe I'm the only real being, and everything's in my head, and there's no universals like Occam is saying. And everything is just in my own mind. Does that make sense? Does everyone see how in this logic course you build this mountain with Aquinas? Now we're going to start coming down to postmodernism. You see what I'm saying? Or going up? I mean, Barb loves postmodernism, um, or maybe she doesn't. I don't know. But I, we're going to get to David Foster Wallace in the class. We're going to get to a lot of like, it's all in my head, man. It's all in my head, bro. Yes. Could you please clarify the term universal? Absolutely. A universal means a kind of like um, a, a one standard thing that is the perfect, uh, the perfect um, law for all things. So it, Plato would say there is a universal chair form of a chair in heaven and it's the perfect chair and all and it's, it's like the chair daddy or the chair mommy and all other chairs in existence are related to that chair all chairs take their chairness from the daddy chair that's a universal there's an ultimate source for everything you know god is the ultimate universal right aquinas says you know god is he who exists and we all take our existence from him and plato Again, even though um, Aquinas is so much more influenced by Aristotle, but Plato has this idea of forms. Everything in existence has a mommy or a daddy in the perfect realm. Like there's a perfect dog, a perfect tree. And again, I'm not, I'm not explaining this perfect. Does that make sense, though? But th 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 there, is, there is one thing that is like the parent of all things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Occam says there are no parents. They're just individual orphans, and they're, they're all different. And Chesterton will famously tackle this problem in his work. We're going to talk about it in three classes. And he says, he, he, he's, Chesterton, of course, is with 
Aquinas. He's anti Occam. He's like, well, if there are no universal features, then you can't call them chairs. Because if they're all perfectly individual, there is nothing in common. But we're saying they're all chairs. When you sit in them, they're, 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 and then there must be some universal principles. Trying to reconcile the universal and the particular is one of the coolest problems in philosophy. Like, am I you? Are you me? No. We're not, you know, Buddhist kind of Eastern mysticism. We are all part of the one. No. And that can be easily proven. You know, you and I don't have a hive mind. We're individuals. And the greatest, you know, kind of simple example is the individuality of the fingerprints. If you and I put our fingerprints down, they're going to be different. And they're all, they're all unique. But are we all so different? All of us breathe with our lungs, see with our eyes, right? We have these, that's what's that's what's at play here. And until William of Ockham, I'm not saying he's the first person to you know, invent this, but until William of Ockham, especially in this class, this logic class, there was this idea that we've accepted from the philosophers through Cicero and Aristotle, like things logically build on one another and you can use your reason despite original sin. Original sin has wounded us. Right? We have concupiscence where we're, we're in this valley of tears. But grace, grace, Aquinas says, does not destroy nature, but builds upon it. Grace can help us up and we can use reason, faith and reason, John Paul II, two wings upon which you rise, contemplation of truth, and we can understand things. And there are universal features, mommies and daddies, perfect version to bind stuff together because ultimately there's only one source of truth. Remember Aquinas said that? There is no scientific truth or religious truth. There's one source of truth. And the name for that one source of truth is God. He who is. And when you get to Rene Descartes next class, and we're talking about, I think, therefore I am, I'm not sure that I am. I'm not about existence or that God exists. I just know that I'm thinking right now. But you guys might be AI, whatever. You get to that thing. You get to what you're saying when you were, when you were younger that you thought maybe I'm the only one who exists, right? Um, this is very, very cool. This is in terms of like, this, this is like the, the rub here. Before I move on, does everyone understand that? Does that make sense? Yes. I want to ask this. As you were describing all that, I got stuck on this spot. So universal thing like a chair. Okay, that's great. But then we have universal principles. Uh, and most of us would probably agree, thou shalt not kill would be one of those. Um, but then, well, wait a minute, what about just war? What mm -hmm. about capital punishment? What about abortion? What about yeah? That's where do you draw the line? Universal. Yeah. Therein lies the, the problem. But see, that's why a lot of people say too that, you know, um, and this is where, again, I'm not a philosopher. I'm a civil war historian, ultimately, by professional training. So I don't want to also go way too deep into these things and give you false information. But this is why philosophically people say he's not even a pure nominalist, rather a conceptualist. He's more allied to a concept to conceptualism than nominalism in the most extreme type. Nominalism, the most extreme type being there is no connective thread whatsoever. I think that can easily be demolished, right? There's obviously things that connect us. Like I just said, breathing, everyone, there's no culture on earth that says it's okay to kill people for no reason. They're, they say it's okay to kill, kill people who are criminals or just war. There's no one saying yeah, you can just do whatever you want. I've never met a culture like that. Or if they say that, it's like, oh, because this evil tribe or these people we should eliminate. Like it's always, no one, there's no culture that's in its laws, like just whoever you want to, you know, you can go harm. So there's, there's obviously universal things. Please note that is what we should write down for today. That's the logic, plumber's logic question today. How do I reconcile? What is the balance between universality and particularity? Imagine universal, imagine a scale of zero to 100. 100 is full universality. Everything is like everything else. We're all one, right? Zero is pure particularity. We're all 100% unique. Nothing unites us. And I think probably we would say, I don't, I'm going to pose a question to you now. I want a logical answer. What do you think? I'd say no one would say zero or 100. I would say it's, it's logical. Bring in our plumber. He just fixed the pipes. And now he asked him the question as he's on the way out the door. Hey, Teddy, what do you think? You mean like, obviously, it's not zero or 100. Obviously, it's not true that there's nothing that unites us. That's ridiculous. We couldn't call ourselves human beings. The fact that we have a general universal category means we have some universal features, right? But obviously, we're not all one. Obviously, we have our own, even like stuff like I like football, I like the opera, like even stuff like that. There's a million unique features, right? Where does it lie? What do you think? Is it just the blah, gray, 50? Oh, it's a perfect balance. 
what do you think is the balance between universality? Everything is common, you know, common universal uh, forms or full particularity, full uniqueness. Where does society stand? Are we becoming more collectivized? Do communists want to become more, you know, we're all the same, right? Uh, libertarians are super individualistic. Are, what do you think? Thoughts? Open question thoughts. It's interesting. When I was growing up and in school, it seemed like when I took philosophy in high school, most of the um, students in my philosophy class thought that everything that you were depended on your environment and how you were raised. Mm -hmm. um, everything you believed, how, how good you were in school and, and whatnot. Um, I think we have um, maybe left that attitude behind somewhat. Um, so, so we, 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 um, we've left the, the, we're all the same except for our environment, um, attitude. I think it's still right, it's a nature nurture, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. still, but we're not, um, we're not on that extreme end of the nurture. Anymore. Who else? What, what do you all think? As a society, are we more collective or individualistic? You just simple as that. Yeah, I am a little more individualistic. Okay, so we're more, we're no. kind of closer to nominalism. I think it, it really, right, it, for me. Or we think we're individualistic while we're collective. Yeah, okay. it, it comes down to what lens we use. Yeah. So with Idaho, yeah, we all like to think of ourselves as individualistic, and I'm my own person, and I have a couple of acres out in the woods or whatever. But then again, we also, with our conservative backbone, we're not tolerating individualism in a sense that, oh, well, there are thousands of different sexes. You know, there you can be whatever you want to be. No, 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 no. We have a dictionary. See, I think exactly. I, I think that it definitely, like, I, I don't know what a number is, but again, you know, from zero to hundred, it's definitely like a mix. I think most rational plumbers logic people that we're trying to become in this class would say it's both. There are universal truths that we ascribe to. Those of us that are define ourselves, thank God, as you know, devout Catholics, God help us, you know, be that. We're very much about universal principles and Ten Commandments and love God above all and the neighbors yourself, and even universal principles like I'm going to follow the full magisterium of the church's infallible teaching. But I'm saying, like, even the most basic, like, I just believe the Bible, kind of, you know, Bible only Christian, or even a person that wants to be a, 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 an atheist, I want to be a good person, believes in universal principles, like, be nice or kind, or even stuff like that. But like it's 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 very simple, I think, to immediately point out things that are universal versus you know, I think it's a, a both. And the church, in her wisdom, is always so much. Bishop Barron constantly hammers his home. The church is both and. The church is just like with Christ. Is Christ, you know, God or man? He's true God and true man. He's both and. He's both. And like maybe a, a reason that things you know heresies often emerge out of the Catholic faith is because the Catholic faith is so perfectly balanced. The Catholic faith and the Holy Mother Church is so balanced, she includes all the kind of points and shows us where the lines are. And it's very easy for someone to say, I'm just going to take this one thing out and just make my whole system about this. And it's like, you have some points to say things are nominalistic, but not all the way, right? And it's like, and a lot of these heresies are always being concocted by priests and people who are Catholics because they have the full knowledge of the way that this teeters and this delicate spider silk balance. And I can exaggerate, reduce, move up however I want. And it's like that maybe is the ultimate meaning, a great logical term we learned in this class, of Aristotle's golden mean. The truth is always Goldilocks's porridge balance. It seems like society and reality is individualistic and collective. Not, I don't know a single person who's full individualist. Oh, I live in the I live in the forest off the grid, make my own food. Like you're still, thank God that God made a climate for you to not die. And no one is fully individualistic, nor is anyone fully dependent on it. Even the most collective, I want the big daddy government to take care of me. He still has to get out of bed, you know, do something individually. Like, no one is, is either, right? It's impossible. You're, there's a mix. And maybe the, go ahead, yeah. Oh, I was thinking, what about um, someone who is handicapped and truly totally dependent, can't get out of bed? You, you'd be getting closer to kind of 
full lack of individualism. If a person, God bless them, they are physically handicapped and, and, and yeah, physically handicapped and mentally handicapped. The person who's physically handicapped is have a lot of intellectual agency, tons of, right? You know, reading books, writing stuff, whatever. Look like Stephen Hawking, yeah. God rest his soul. Had, he was very much individualistic despite being totally incapacitated physically. But, but so he, he only has a brain stand. Yeah, even, even that is still a child of God. And that's, we get into a whole other ethical debate and thank God for the full defense of life. of like that person is still an equal child of God, still has that individuality retained and being that irrepeatable person. And perhaps the reason they're there, you can fast to teach other people about the sanctity of life, right? So their life has that individual meaning. So it's impossible to go either way, zero to 100. There is some kind of mix always. I think it's the danger with the, what you mentioned, the, the Goldilocks 4-H kind of compromise is um, once you buy into that, then you are denying there is an actual truth. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if if the compromise is, well, you be you. Yeah, I'll truth is you. always compromised, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying that. Right, right. I mean, I realize that that's a danger with that. And, and that's, still, that's, that's brilliant. That's, you're exactly right. Yeah, you could just fall into this. Well, the truth is always synthesizing things, just combining two things. I'm super pacifist, I'm super pro-war. The truth is a little bit of war. Yeah, it's like, no, right? Just like blend them together. No, that's actually the worst possible pride thing, you know? I said I was gonna talk about nominalism second because it's the most important thing we've been talking about. It. So let me finish up the nominalism stuff because we're all, let's be, I see already a lot of this stuff is very kind of like, not confusing, but it's pretty it's pretty dense stuff. And so just stay on nominalism and we'll move to this other thing, which is actually much simpler. So in metaphysics, nominalism is the view that universals and abstract objects do not actually exist other than being merely names or labels. And John Stuart Mill summarized nominalism in the ap apogem, quote, there is nothing general except names. And so you have in not you have in, in law constitutional nominalism. Please note this: you see how this leads to relativism, right? If there is nothing universal except names. You get to the, like the, the, the deconstructionist, the 20th century, like Jacques Derrida, language construction. Well, Barb, you know, what does it mean for a man to be unfaithful to his wife? What does it mean for a man to commit assault? Assault and infidelity, that's just a word. What does it mean, right? That's terrifying. That's very anti-Catholic. William of Ockham would not give you his John Hancock. He would not sign on to this. Well, I'm not saying that. But you see where this snowball got out of control. If there is no truth, if there is no reality except th things being named stuff, well, actually, for me, I think the name is something else. Let's apply it right now. We're not in a, we're not threatening to have a recession. Two quarters of GDP negative, it's not a recession, it's uh, transitional, right? You see how nominalism is used today in your face? This, this, this like, you know, this double speak well, uh, politicians. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Pat, I think that you were talking about how, like, oh, it was a cool light bulb moment for all of us. About like, oh yeah, politicians seem to do red herring arguments and straw man all the time. Politicians are very good at nominalism. Oh, I don't mean that. Well, what do you mean by that word? You know, who the greatest nominalist of modern times is Bill Clinton. What is the definition of is? That's nominalism. What does is mean? Remember that from his trial? So it's like uh, his impeachment thing, whatever the proceedings. So nominalism, if if nominalism again is quote, there is nothing general, universal except names. You see um, where we're going. Nominalism arose in reaction to the problem of universal, specifically accounting for the fact that some things are of the same type. For example, uh, you know, Fluffy and Wonder Bread are both cats. Or the fact that certain properties are repeatable, like the grass, um, the, the pants, right? Okay, but like what color are the pants, et cetera, right? Like where the chairs, you know, where is the, 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 the essential abstract universal binding notion of the chairiness of the chair? I'm not trying to be funny or cute. I mean, like the, the actual, the very like definition universal property of what makes a chair, where is that common with other chairs versus a super skeptical position? It's just a name. I'm going to call that. Artists and journalists are always trying to make variations of yeah. things that don't look like a chair, be a chair. Brilliant. And when does it fall off the, the rail? And that's that's so brilliant. That's so great. Thank you. Thank you. That is so genius. I'm serious. That, that, yeah, exactly. Your job is to say, when does it stop being a chair? No, I'm sorry, it's not a chair anymore. A chair is not defined by I can sit on it. I can sit on I can sit on the floor. And if you're just saying, oh, you can sit on this thing, it's a chair. No. 
because a bean, bag, a bean, yeah, bean bag is not a chair. I say it's lost. It's okay. it's universally, or you can say it is. It's just a name. Are you what you call bean bag? I call chair. You see the problem of anomalies. Exactly, exactly, exactly. The last thing on last thing on 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 Occam. Occam argued abstract concepts have no fundamentum outside the mind. Let's finish with him there and talk about his other principle. But that's probably the best way. That's a good close about his nominalism. One more time. William of Ockham argued that abstract concepts have no fundamentum outside the mind. That's just a Latin word, obviously, for foundation, right? That Betsy, what you claim is absolutely what you claim is abstract, the universal, the chariness of things, it's just your mind. That's just your maybe you're the only one who exists, like you said earlier, right? Do you see what I'm saying? And you see how this becomes a problem. And you see why I said, I think now, why he can be arguing to be the first kind of postmodern thinker. He's saying the opposite of Aquinas, do not trust your senses, Sam Kresslin. They lie to you. Do not trust the logic. What is, Sam, when you talk about logic, logic's a thing in your mind. It has the, the concept of logic has no fundament outside of your imagination. Do you see the problem? His other, here's the other thing he's known for though, in the last two minutes. Nominalism is his most famous thing, or his razor. What is his razor? This is cool. I like his razor. I think his razor is very, very accurate. Well, what is Occam's razor? Occam's razor is when you have a situation and you're forced with two explanations as to what's going on here. Um, the one that the one explanation that requires the least assumptions is more likely accurate. William? So if we compare uh, Ptolemy's a geocentric system with all the cycles and epicycles and everything, that's um, a lot more complex than the heliocentric system. So, um, start with the, with a simpler one first and see so, if that if that works. So heliocentric actually works more sure. simply. The, the catchphrase, and thank you both for your answers, Exactly. The catchphrase is, quote, entities must not be multiplied beyond necessity. The real plumber's logic, I have my literal blue collar on, Occam's razor is the simplest explanation is usually true. That's Occam's razor. Why is, why is Joe late to class today? You divide, and guys, this, I'm on, I want to freak out. This is so awesome. Because um, Occam in nominalism goes full postmodern. Maybe he goes super woke. He's ready to be hired by Biden. I don't know. He's a really modern man. This one is super Aquinas style. This is super subsidiarious. Betsy Johnson, representative of subsidiarity, right? These two great principles of Catholic social te teaching. Solidarity, we're all bound together as one. Subsidiarity, whatever should be taken care of on a local level should be. Okay. This seems to be very subsidiarious. Start with the simplest thing. Barb, if you have a problem in town, don't call Biden. Talk to the mayor. Start slow. If you have a problem, don't jump to the craziest conclusions. So once more, let me say, why is Joe late to class today? It is anti-logic. I think you'll agree. Anti-common sense. Say Joe's probably late to class because he was abducted by aliens. That's Don't start there. He's probably late to class because he overslept or maybe, maybe even more complex, but his tire popped out. Probably not that he's abducted by aliens. It's probably that, not that he works for the KGB. He's an agent and whatever, right? That's don't jump to the crazy stuff first. Start low. He couldn't find his keys. That couldn't, that, is that is that how beautiful? Is that so logical? He probably couldn't find his keys. That's it. It wasn't that he was he was eaten by a monster or like whatever. Like, no, entities <laughs> entities must not be multiplied beyond necessity. Why did city council cancel that parade? The St. Patrick's parade. People. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And conspiratorial thinking often violates Occam's razor. Oh, it's probably this, this. They probably canceled the parade because it wasn't enough money in the budget. That's it. They don't hate St. Patrick or there's a conspiracy against Irish people. They probably just didn't have enough money for it. Start with the simplest thing. Why did Trish, you know, give me road rage the other day or something like that, right? Because I cut her off, right? Or she just was, was it was not because there's this secret plot around Moscow to every time that someone sees me in a car. So like flip me off, give me like whatever, right? This kind of crazy conspiratorial thinking always violates Occam's razor, which is very logical and beautiful. Start with the simplest explanation. If that doesn't work, then build up. And this is where you see, and I am a believer in, definitely, because truly may God help me, God grant me the grace to be like Aquinas and pursue truth wherever it leads. I believe some conspiracy, some, some conspiracy sadly are probably true. 
But how do you find out they're true? By eliminating the, the logical stuff first. Okay, we've eliminated 30 things and none of them, maybe it is this crazy thing. But Aka would say you only get to the crazy thing after like 30, after you start with the common stuff first. Probably because he forgot his keys. Entities must not be multiplied beyond necessity. If they necessitate, multiply them. Then go deeper into the answers. Paper is like thrown in the air. Look at that. It's coming down like snow. <laughs> Dashing through the snow. We haven't said a long time. Ago. We haven't said a long time. Mm -hmm. On a one horse open sleigh. Now, what's the best part of science? Uh, bells on bobtails ring. Making spirits bright. Oh, what fun it is to. Okay. I want you guys to jump in the song. That sucked. That was fail. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to sing with a lot of emotion like this. Where's Brad King? Where's Brad King? I like to look in his eyes when I sing. Where's Brad King? Use Occam's razor. He probably forgot his keys. Like this. That's great. Didn't rhyme. He was abducted by aliens because they said his last name was King. They didn't follow Occam's razor. They thought he was the monarch of the whole world. <laughs> They're like, oh, beep. His last name is King, but we don't do that on our planet. We don't get. Yeah. Yeah, guys, um, this was so fun. This was a really, we needed to have some lightness. This class was way too brain cracker. This was a, this was a good, like, dense class. Nominalism is dense stuff. Just please know William of Ockham is kicking off our kind of postmodern train. How do I feel about postmodernism? I don't know. I mean, I'm a devout Catholic. Praise God. I believe 100% in, in the reality of magisterial Catholic truth. I kind of like postmodern art and literature. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's so American of me. And so I want to have my cake and eat it too. But a lot of stuff that William of Ockham and Rene Descartes and people that we're following on later on are going to build off of is going to be this kind of radical skepticism. And what can we know? That's not what we did the first half of the semester. It was very much, you can trust your senses, and egg is an egg. He probably forgot his keys. Um, okay. Definitions, but yeah. Whenever we hear postmodernism or modern art, I mean, what even is that? You know. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my my art is my art is just it is what it is, bro. Okay, great. So it's nothing, it's ever what well, is it? Is it? Into the term, to my to my knowledge, modern art was kind of born with poor bay. Uh because he was painting peasants instead of royalty. Sure, yeah, the, kind of the mundane everyday. Yes, sure. Yeah. Sure. So what does that mean? Yes, yeah, Cesare had a Ecce Homo, a, a picture of when Christ is presented, and it's like the first time Christ is like off the side. Yeah. The ultimate, it's even blasphemous even, but it's kind of like, oh, you know, you, all art, like Duccio's Madonna and Child is focused on Christ, he's true God, true man. I just think he's a part of the thing. Everyone's equal, that kind of crap. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so so last thing before we sign off, God bless you all. Thank you for being here. Really quickly, I said this, to, to, I, I accosted you on the stairs and stopped you and told you something right now. We have a HIPAA lecture on, on Wednesday. Look, I'm, I'm actually not begging. I'm so honored and glad I always, I always have like 40, 50 people who come and like it breaks my heart with like I can't believe it like you said it's so true it's like people have stuff to do and it's I'm always so touched by it I mean that sincerely but I, this talk I'm so pumped about I know I, I'm a shameless self promoter and I always like hype my own talks but this talk takes place in Moscow Idaho I'm going to be sending you later I made a promotional video about it a seven minute clip where I even read the introduction and so then to go and be able to just get the, the no no in, in in the clip yeah exactly. In the clip, in, in the clip itself, in the, I'm not even laughing because it's like, you know, I can't make you come. It's like, oh, I better not send this because it won't come. Like, you know, if I don't send it, she'll come. It's like, come if you want, I hope you come. But no, in, in what I'm saying is it, my talks are usually, um, my talks are usually about 5,000 words, which takes about 40 minutes to read. This talk is 12,000 words. It'd be like an hour and a half. It's going to be done over two parts. I'm very excited about it. It has a very good twist. The talk is gonna is gonna you know the first six thousand words the two normal hip lectures on March and April, which will take us out from the summer and then I won't present again until September like like you know normal schedule. But I'm excited about this talk. It's a very Lenten talk, and what I'm gonna say in the promo promotional video later is often the talks are both very abstract 
and often like adult themed. This this is very straightforward. Like whole family's welcome, and it's 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 an old school story. Meaning I'm not trying to be cute with like the guy starts rapping in the middle and singing and stuff. And I like that kind of postmodern form. This is a very straightforward story. And what I'm going to really try to sell people on is it takes place in Moscow. The whole story takes place in our hometown the entire time. And what I about the stairs, last one before I start to sign off, I understand people were saying, you guys were saying earlier, like it's, it's become a very student thing. That's great. If I have any say in this, they're my talks. I want everyone there. Like, I hate that. This is only for students. Yeah, I will hope everyone comes. I would hope that they'd empty out the nursing homes and these like 90 year old folk would come to the talks. Everyone's invited. I said, I did not want like, oh, only the youth or some kind of crap like that. Like, so what I'm saying is, if you can make it on Wednesday night, basically what I'm saying is, um, come, you know, or never speak to me again. Um, I'm not friends. <laughs> God bless you all. See you later. Thank you.